So, yeah, we put on some light. Um, we only have one microphone, Terry, so we're going to be sharing it. which I'm sure it is not an easy uh, process, you know. And I don't know if any of you have seen his uh, short, the, the Best Little Horror House in Texas, which uh, has been out and about there at the moment. It's a real eye-opener, ear-opener, whatever. But um, I don't, I'm not going to just do a tip, like, talk specifically about the, um, the film that we just watched, although we will ask, we will talk about some of it. But I'd really just be interested in Terry's kind of uh, take on the process which you guys are all going through at the moment, even though it's short film, it's still filmmaking, and it's all about the, not not the what you're making, but why you're making it, is that right? Uh, I don't want to be sitting here talking shit when you're all doing your own thing, but uh, this is the second day of the weekend, is it for you? Yeah. Or the third? So you're, you've been shooting all day? Mm-hmm. Okay, so well, the thing we were talking about outside, um, I'm happy to ask or answer any questions you want, but I also don't want to be talking stuff that bears no relation to you. So, in terms of what you were saying outside, he was saying that he was making a six man, minute short and he nearly had a fucking nervous breakdown. But he says, What's the difference between that and a feature? And then he said, It's what is it, 30 times longer or whatever? The idea of a short and a feature film, there is no difference. Literally, there's no difference if you're doing it for the right reasons. And we were talking outside about the difference between the how and the why. And he was saying he had no idea how you make a feature. And we were talking about the conversation that it really doesn't matter how you're making a film as long as you have a why. As long as you have a fucking reason for making it. Unless, as long as you have a theme that is worth interrogating and something you're willing to live or die by. Something you're willing to make all the sacrifices for. But if you're just making a film to make a film, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. Because it's a, it's a war against impossibility. You're trying to generate in people a desire to put their own reality aside in favor of a reality that nobody can have any clue how it's going to unfold. So, but if you have a why, you will find a way of doing it, no matter what. That, that includes shooting it on your phone, it includes mugging somebody, robbing somebody, doing whatever the fuck is required to get the film made. With something like Patrick's Day or with Charlie Casanova or... or even a short film, if you have the why, it will get you through everything. If you don't have the why, you will <coughs> fuck up at every single opportunity and you won't know how to address it because you don't have a why. So ask yourself why you're making the film that you're making. Ask yourself why you're here for this weekend. Some of you are now have traveled from different places, some of you are from here, but in this room among you, there's a level of extraordinary courage. If you have the why, you will all step up for each other. If you don't have the why, your ego will start to fall into place. Your fear, your doubt, your bullshit, all the fucking stuff that happens without the why. If you have the why, everybody will step up. You will actually be amazed that there's a fucking army in this room who will step up for you. So find the fucking why and you'll get the how. Yeah, so speaking of the how, but the... After coming off um, Charlie Casanova, which for you, I know, uh, um, which was, a, which was a, a struggle to get made in the first place, you, you kind of just, you started off, you just put a post out there looking for people saying, I want to make a movie, I, I, I want to make this film. But then, um, and it, it kind of riled up a certain uh, portion of the population or the establishment. Um, but between that, uh, uh, time of finishing Johnny Casanova and making uh, Patrick's Day, uh, what was the process like in terms of getting the funding? Was it, how different was it from the kind of crowdsourced uh, way that you made uh, Johnny Casanova and stuff and then get, get into the, basically to the first day of the shoot? You know? Well, for those of you who don't know, Charlie Casanova was a film that was made for less than a thousand euros and it was picked up for distribution by Studio Canal and distributed in the UK and Ireland in the cinema which is unprecedented for a film like that. It's also one of the fucking most hated films of all time. So you find yourself in that position where you go, a struggle to be made, it wasn't a struggle to get it made. No more of a struggle or no less of a struggle than a film like this, which has a budget of a half a million. The budget for Charlie Casanova was 937 euros. The difference is nothing. The difference is what happens in front of the lens of the camera. 
what two actors are doing in front of the frame that you've created is all that matters. Money doesn't influence that. Money is not pertinent to what's happening in front of the lens. Now, money might buy you a different kind of camera, might buy you, buy you a different kind of crew, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what's happening in front of the fucking lens. So, we go from a thousand euro film to a half a million, and the next film we're making is a million. There's still no fucking difference. It requires a kind of insanity, a kind of audacity, and a belief that perhaps the world might be a better fucking place for the 90 minutes that you're creating, as opposed to making something that makes the world a worse fucking place. And it becomes that basic. So in terms of finance, what is finance? Finance is something that gives you the freedom to shoot the film that you're trying to shoot. Most of us have the capacity to shoot something on our phones. And we talked about this before, but your phones, the technology on your phones is better than the technology that would have cost a quarter of a million pounds 25 years ago. You look at television now from the 80s or the 90s, look at the quality of the image, the quality of the sound, it's shit. Not only do we accept it at the time, we engage with it at the time. You have the technology in your fucking pocket to make a movie, to cut the movie on your phone. No time in history has there been the level of revolution te technology that you have, and yet you're some of the laziest bastards who ever fucking lived. <laughs> Why? Imagine what Van Gogh would do, imagine what Mozart would do, imagine what the artist would do with the technology that's in your fucking pocket. That's not about finance. That's about, again, the why. Why the fuck do you want to make movies? If you want to do it to get later, get famous, to get rich, you're a fucking moron. There's a billion easier ways to get all three. But if you want to do it because you feel driven to make something that might affect somebody in a dark room, then you get the beginning of something interesting, and that's not driven by finance. So, um, the casting in this film, you, you, you got very lucky as well, that's also something, I mean, I know we, we make films here and sometimes you have good actors, sometimes you have bad actors and stuff, but you, you don't, you generally don't have a choice on who you're actually casting, you kind of, you're, you're put in a group and you, you make do with what you have, but you, you, in the process, I mean, okay, you got lucky as well with um, Charlie Casanova, you know, but then, um, talk about the, uh, getting people like Mo Dunford and uh, Kerry Fox and stuff like uh, were they interested to work with you? What, did they jump at the idea to get involved in, in someone who had made this kind of pre only previously a thousand euro, thousand euro movie? Like, so how did you get those people? Uh, there's two things about casting is that in terms of lucky, getting lucky, talent is priceless. Back to money. You cannot put a price on talent. You got to protect it with everything you have but you also got to provoke it to wake the fuck up. So with something like Charlie Casanova, Emmett Scanlon, he played Charlie Casanova, and now he's doing brilliantly, and deservedly so, but what people don't know about Emmett Scanlon, he's the hardest working motherfucker out there. He will break his back for an audition. He will break his back in an audition to try and make something utterly remarkable. And he could have 50 auditions and get one of those jobs. Not only would he not be disappointed, he'd be thrilled that he got one of those fucking jobs, and he will work as hard for the next 50. But he wasn't the original choice and the original choice would have done a better job. The original choice wanted to do it, and then he wasn't ready. And I had to pull the plug because we had 11 days to shoot it. In terms of Patrick's Day, we have the lead actor here, Mo Dunford. Mo Dunford is a brilliant actor, brilliant young man. He's not the first choice. He wasn't the first choice, and the first choice would have done a better fucking job. But the financiers then decide about casting. So despite all our bullshit about celebrating Irish culture, the four principal leads in Patrick's Day were Irish. The film board would not greenlight the cast. The first actor was Aaron Monaghan, who unfortunately, many of you don't even know, he's one of the greatest actors in the world. He's won a Tony Award, for Christ's sake. But he wasn't famous enough so they didn't go with him. We had two other actors to play the mother and to play the cop, and they wouldn't go with him. So we ended up going to fucking New Zealand and Britain. Now the idea of going we talk about promoting Irish culture, and then behind the scenes being told you can't cast these people. That's where casting becomes a nightmare. Because instead of wanting to celebrate our own stories and our own actors and our own artists, we end up reaching for people who have a certain IMDB rating that some fucking moron in the marketing department defines as somehow having sway and power. It's bullshit. It's total horseshit. 
These marketing scum, by the way, will fuck you every time. They're fucking morons. But they have extraordinary power. And they define who gets cast. So with Kerry Fox, I had seen Kerry Fox in Jane Campion's movie, An Angel at My Table. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. If you get the chance to see it, you really should. And I, I said to the casting director, what's the chances of getting a Terry Fox type? And she says, I can get a letter to the actual Kerry Fox. So I wrote a letter, very sincere letter, wrote to Kerry, and within 24 hours I was in London. We sat down, we went through the script page by page, and she did it. She did it for fuck all money. Mo Dunford is something different. Mo Dunford was completely unknown. As an actor, I wanted Aaron Monaghan. They didn't want him. And then I says, okay, I'll shoot this fucking film on a phone if I have to. Now, that's one of the benefits of shooting something like Charlie Casanova for a thousand euros. When you threaten them that you shoot it on your phone, the stupid cunts believe you. So then you find yourself in a position where you get a little bit of power. And then they said, okay, if we get somebody who's 50% as good as Aaron Monaghan. And what they didn't know is that I had been privately communicating with Mo Dunford. Now, I'm not being uh, indiscreet here because he said it publicly, but Mo's brother is schizophrenic. So Mo would have a greater knowledge of schizophrenia than most fucking psychologists through engagement with his own brother. He also had a hunger beyond belief. So what we did was we set it up. I said, I want one call back. And we would call back Mo Dunford. He didn't know he was the only call back. The producers were going crazy because we were getting close to shooting and I refused to cast any of these blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pretty boy fuckers that they wanted to cast in the role. They didn't know that I'd been working with Mo privately, so when Mo came in to do the audition, we barely communicated, but we had everything set up already. He did the audition, he was brilliant in the audition, but instead of turning to the cast director and the producers, I turned to the people doing the filming. And I said, what did you think? And of course, there's always a hierarchy in a film, so they're scared, so they look up at the producers, and I said, don't look at those cunts, what did you fucking think? And they answered, they answered spontaneously and honestly, they were deeply moved, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, we want more Dunford. And you would think that would be enough to seal the deal, but the financiers were still not happy. They still wanted a name. And they asked the question, can he be soft? And it sounds like a bullshit term, I didn't even know what the fuck it meant. So Mo was 24 at the time, he's this kid who was completely unknown, He's out there auditioning for a movie. He doesn't know what the fuck is happening. And what we didn't know was that he had cancelled the holiday that he had booked to Malta six months earlier. So I said, the producers want to know, can you be soft? And he didn't know what it meant either. I said, but come on, we're going to my gaff. So we went back to my place. I remember playing a game. And I got Mo drunk. Now, Mo didn't know whether he was going to be spit roasted or what the fuck was going to happen. So he's sitting there and he's drunk. And I call him my dog. And I rubbed ham on the side of Mo's face. And the dog jumped up on the couch and was licking his face like it was fucking sex. And I told Mo to say some of the lines from the scene. And I filmed it on the phone. And Mo was drunk and playing with the dog and loving the dog. And the dog is loving him and he's saying lines from the fucking scene. And suddenly we emailed it to the financiers and they said yes. <laughs> so all the money that was spent, all the bullshit dance we went through, these stupid fucking morons cast a guy because he was drunk and a dog was licking his face. <laughs> so that's how you get cast. Oh, so <clears throat> we were also, before, while you were watching the film, we were just having a chat. So we were talking about editing. And from this point on now in this Kino spree, most people are now getting, the editor's time is coming and they're starting to kick in. They're going to be editing to a deadline. They have to be handing over the films by 7 o'clock tomorrow so we can screen them. So you mentioned like with Charlie Casanova, we were talking about editing and we were saying, uh, Terry said like, um, he'd like to maybe even take some time, some of the shots out of this, short, shorten uh, Patrick's Day by, by a little bit. But he'd also talked about um, Charlie Casanova and that maybe he would like to put some stuff back in there that, that he left out. So uh, can you talk maybe about your process with editing and um, in terms of, I, I don't know, in, in the, how you approach that, do you work with an editor, do you, do, do you basically, are you like one of these filmmakers who sees you have your film in your head and that's it, you know what it's going to be in the editing suite, or are you still in the creative process in there and still kind of experimenting and not sure what you're going to come out with at the end of it? Um, I know there are some geniuses, maybe there's some geniuses in the room who have every shot already planned in their head. I think you're a fucking wanker if that's what you have. Because if you had an idea in your bed sit six months ago and you want everybody to subsume their capacity for that fucking moronic masturbatory fantasy you had six months ago, then you're not a filmmaker. You're just jerking off. 
if you're not in an edit suite to rediscover your film, by rediscovering it means it's for an audience. The provocation is for an audience. What you're doing, everything you're doing is for an audience. If you think you're doing it for you, go into the jacks and jerk off, because that's all you're going to be fucking doing. If you're trying to make a film for an audience, then you're constantly going to interrogate the material and the reason for its existence. What is the effect on the audience? And that's why, because it was just a brief conversation we had outside, you were asking how many times I'd seen the film. I've never seen Charlie Casanova with an audience, and I saw this once in Paris. I was forced to watch it. Because it's not fair to watch it with an audience. But you hope in the edit suite, what you're trying to do is move people. Now, I think the film is about 10 minutes too fucking long, but that's, it's too, too late now. But if you look at the idea of what you're doing in, a, in a, an edit suite, if you have an editor with you, a good editor is an extraordinary artist. A good ed editor is beyond measure a colleague in a war. It is somebody beside you that might save your fucking life. If you're determinedly, uh, determinedly trying to recreate the masturbatory image you had in your head six months ago, you're not a director, you're a fucking moron. If you're in an edit suite trying to find a way to stimulate and provoke an audience where they have a reaction that might be personal to them, now you're beginning to understand the function and the purpose of editing. So I just wondered if anybody here has any questions for Terry in terms of either the film you just saw or in the process of filmmaking at that also. Would you like to? Do you speak about you, uh, you don't need a mic, I don't think so. So when you talk about you, you don't really have a specific idea of what edits you're going to do. So does that mean you kind of have a sense of feeling you want to create and then you're trying to get that in the editing room? Good. Do I need a mic? Can everybody hear me? Well, it's all right. Yeah. Um, when I say you don't have a sense, of course you have a sense. The purpose, and you've got to ask every time what's the purpose or the function of the decisions you're making. If you're not asking about the purpose or the function, you're just making random decisions. And they might even feel good to you when you make them. And they might be accidental or they might be planned. But you don't have a functional purpose for their existence. Therefore, it's not about an audience. So when you talk about the language of a film, with, with Patrick's Day, the cinematographer, Michael Lavelle, wonderful man, but we sat down and we broke the film into five segments before we started shooting. And those five segments were related to isolation, related to fragmentation, related to the character's journey. Once we were clear on those five segments, those five sections, I'll tell you what we did. I, I, I don't mean it to sound indulgent, but I, just, just to give you an idea of when we're talking about sets. We managed to talk the producer into believing that we needed time to storyboard the film. So he sent us away for three days to this big fancy fucking hotel. And the first thing we did when we got to the hotel was check the wine list. <laughs> Straight away, and the reason we did that is because it was much more important that we fell in love with each other because we were going to go to war together. And we had one fight on the whole film, and it was on the last day. And it was a fight, I'll explain a little why, but it was a stupid fight over nothing, but it was the only fight we ever had. And the reason being is that we decided to go through the script, page by page. And he sat down with the storyboard to draw the first frame. And what he drew on the page was a very impressive image. But we had no idea who our cast was. So why the fuck are we drawing images? We need to draw a sense of what it's supposed to be. Once we defined it in relation to language, what we did is we sat down in the IADT library, cinema library, and we went through books of photographs. And we had those five categories. And separately from each other, we went through the categories and trying to find images that replicated what we thought should be the sense of each category. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what we did was I picked three movies, three deliberate movies. I picked The Graduate for structure and form. I picked One Floor Over the Cooper's Nest for a sense of the world we're in. And I picked Punch Drunk Love for a sense of the emotion. Those three films combined, we watched them, we sat down, we studied them, and we had the conversation. So what happened was we shot this in 14 days, but we saved months of preparation and weeks of onset time because we knew the category in terms of those five categories, and we were able to reach for the laptop and go, this is the shot, this is the sense of the shot. So I'll give you an example. There's a shot where they have a post coital cigarette and she's sitting and he's naked and she's on top of him. And there's some conversation about being dead inside or something. That shot is a direct reconstruction of a photograph. So it's, it's, it saves a massive amount of time. But the reason for it is that you're going, what do you want the audience to see, think, and feel? What are you trying to do to the audience? What is the function and form of the shot? So we knew the lenses we were using because we wanted it to be 
the approximation of the face. The human face for us was the greatest landscape there was. So there's very, very few wide shots in this, and if there is a wide shot, it's just really to, sh to show the separation between two characters. But it's probably 90% fucking medium close to close up. That's not accidental in the edit later. It's the only shots you have, because you're going, how do you bring an audience into a place where they're normally not allowed to go? So then when you're in an edit, you go, okay, how do we put those together in a way that you hope? You can only hope, because there's mistakes. There's always mistakes. You're always going to fuck up. You're always going to make choices that at the time felt great or seemed great. But the only thing you can measure it against is what's the function of the film, and what is the function and purpose of each scene, and what is the function and purpose of each shot within each scene. And if you're doing it for that reason, then despite the fact that you can occasionally fuck up, you can't go too far wrong if you're doing it for the right reasons. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Just one second. What was the argument you had with the... <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a, an, an intimate scene. We had, we had 26 scenes to shoot at the end of the last day. And it was in my house because the, the uh, guy doing the locations was the dumbest fucking planet. He screwed us completely. So the shop in is a shop around the corner from my gaff. The fucking, uh, all the houses in it are one house. It's all my gaff. We had no, ch we had no choice. We were in a fucking panic. But the cinematographer, in eagerness, not in, uh, in malice, but he reached forward to touch the actress, to try and get her to adjust her body for the frame. And it was at a point when she was incredibly vulnerable. It was during the intimate scene. And I could see her clamming up completely. And I barked and just get your fucking hand off. And he was embarrassed and everyone was embarrassed. And then I, I left, we just broke for lunch and I left and he followed me down. He says, I'm really sorry. He says, I'm really fucking sorry. We had some lunch. And then we had the idea, let's beat the shit out of each other. Go back with fucking black eyes and blood and everything. To see if we can panic that room. But we didn't have time. We were going to get the makeup done. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't a real fight. And he's a magnificent human being. And that's the thing is that surround yourself with artists. Surround yourself with artists who are better than you. Surround yourself with people who will inspire you. Surround yourself with people who constantly leave you in awe of how smart they are, how talented they are. Don't surround yourself with people who are going to say yes to everything you want. Because what you want is not particularly yeah, sorry. Hi, Teddy. How are you? That's a question. Not the time I wait for your answer. <laughs> I know that. Um, come in here. Um, I saw uh, the patterns today, and then the, I love the way you get the risk how to use the camera, how to use the frame, how to use uh, the, uh, make the scene. It's okay for me, because you use a lot close up, and then you use a lot um, on focus, and the back end of focus. I love that. Um, the first time I get in Ireland, 16 years ago, I I think the film is everywhere, it is very square. And then the first person is making me my hair to know how to say that in English. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is your film. This is you. Um, and in your workshop as well, your class. i be honest, I, I understand it only 30%. The rest I don't understand nothing. Okay. Okay, these dumb fucks only understand 20%. <laughs> right. But uh, the, your, your, your energy is coming to me. But um, um, my question is, I know uh, you risk, you take a lot of risk with cameras, you know, you know uh, frames, angles, that's it. But uh, I want to get from you, the director, how you get the actor get the emotion, the vision, or if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, um, get this moment, be in the moment. How do you get that? Well, there's two things. The first thing is that never forget, no matter how pretty the shot, if the content of the frame is not working, the shots are up. So too often we have film schools in this country, and maybe I'm lucky that I didn't go through film school. <coughs> But I've taught them enough of them to see what happens. And the shot is everything. The shot is king. So the cinematographer is treated like they're the fucking filmmaker. And everything, everything is about trying to capture the shot. So they will, again, back to storyboarding. 
They will put six weeks preparation into a shop list. They will put six hours preparation into a shop. And six seconds preparation into an actor. Mm -hmm. The fuck is that? It's completely the wrong order. Yeah. They won't discuss costume with the actor. They won't discuss the scene with the actor. They're afraid of the actor. <laughs> They're either reverentially respectful, which is a, a kind of form of passive aggressiveness anyway, or they just can't communicate at all. Or they're, they're a bully. So what the fuck? That's not directing. If you're trying to make a humanistic film, and you're the biggest fucking dick on the set, with the biggest ego on the set, there's a problem. I'm going to give you some, a simple example. To answer your question without getting too technical. On the first day of the shoot, um, we called for lunch. And the co-producer came up and she said, uh, OK, it's lunchtime. And she said to the lead actors, Kerry Fox and Mo Dumford, uh, you go ahead <coughs> first. And you go with them. And in the corner over there was all the extras. And the extras were sitting there. They've been there the same length of time as everybody else, and they're fucking hungry. And I said, look, and I didn't make it a big deal. I just said, look, just for a second here. I says, nobody's queuing for food here. Nobody is going to be left waiting for food while we stand at the top getting fucking spoon fed. All these people. Let them go first. Now what happens when you do that, suddenly the extras don't know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> they're, they're confused. And you go, how are you doing folks? And you say, you make sure you say hello to them. You make sure you've cast half them because there are people who can be, do something remarkable. You make sure every extra is given an objective, every extra is given a background to their character, and every extra has a reason for existence. Suddenly what happened is, after lunch, the extras are standing around the camera watching the fucking monitor <coughs> with a sense of empowerment and a sense of excitement that's extraordinary. The actors are suddenly hanging in the same space as them, and suddenly not only do they feel included, but they want to make the participation. Now the crew are going, we can't treat the actors like shit because the director has just said from the top down that it's not going to happen. <laughs> the ADs who often treat people like fucking dirt are taken aside and said, don't fucking talk to anybody that again and you're going fucking home. Suddenly everything shifts. Now not only are the actors showing the respect of themselves, but everybody's showing the respect of themselves. Now suddenly we have a conversation about what happens in the frame. So now if an actor tries something, if an actor tries something and it fails, they should be allowed to be celebrated for the failure because they tried. If an actor tries something and it succeeds, they should be celebrated, but immediately you move on. So you don't elevate an actor to the realm of their ego being protected, and you never denigrate an actor to the degree where their ego is hurt. You make sure that it's all about the work. Now, if you have a frame and you put a frame in front of it, an actor, and again, this is Michael Lavelle, the cinematographer, wonderful man. But I said to Michael, don't ask my permission to do something. If you feel that you need to move, move. We have a great guy here who can pull focus. Move with him. Don't say that's not the shot. I say to the actors, if you feel a compulsion to do something, don't ask my permission to do it first. Apologize after the fact. Don't fucking stop it happening. And every, so every time what happened is the great actors, the experienced actors like Kerry Fox, and the completely inexperienced actors suddenly feel like they want to come to work. They want to get excited. Then you have someone like John, who was our first, John Burns, who was our first AD. John Burns is one of the most remarkable men I've ever met. He's Scottish, he's tough as a motherfucker. And he's renowned, he's supposed to have a black belt in, in being a first AD. It's all about scheduling. The first AD is all about making a schedule. On the first day, he was told, make sure that everything is done as it's supposed to be done. On the first day, we were six scenes behind. <laughs> and the reason we were six scenes behind is because I was making sure that the actors, the actors, the actors, the actors. He goes to the producer at about three quarters of it through the day, and he goes, look, I'm telling you now, I don't know how he's doing what he's doing. I don't know why it's working, but it is. But we're behind schedule. I don't want to stop it. Now, if he had said the opposite, if he had said, He's behind schedule, we need to fucking reel him in, it would have destroyed every ounce of trust that was created. Then by the second day, you, have, you always look for a moment, you look for a time, not the second day, the second part of the first day, you always look for a time where the, the crew and the cast need to feel like something special is happening. So in terms of, and I'm not being indiscreet here again because Mo has talked about it in public, but that scene where he breaks down. The scene where he breaks down and he's thinking of her. We shot that on the first day. So he's sitting there and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And we have a whole series of shot lists that are supposed to be captured. And I said, look, forget about all this. Put the camera down here and watch what we're going to do here. And I took him aside and he has a beautiful young son. And I said to him, I, his son's name is Charlie. I said, look, Charlie, 
and he was going through the court system with, with at the time, separated from the mother. I said, Charlie is your, your beautiful son, more than anything in the world. All you want to do is be with that boy. But the devil is in your head, and the devil is trying to trouble you. And he didn't really understand, but he tried it, and I knew he didn't understand. He said, look, when I say the devil is in your head, I mean that unless you beat the devil out of your head, he's going to make you fuck your own son. Now suddenly he broke. Instantly you can see that look in his eye. So when he's punching himself, those punches are real. And he's pounding, and he's in the realm of deeply personal engagement. Because he knows that the one thing he could be accused of in a court case that could destroy his relationship. Now, what I did was I used basic information about his personal life, but used it in a way that allowed him to suddenly become incredibly expressive. Now, I got into huge trouble for it. Not because I used personal information, but because the co-producer went psychotic. She says, what if he's bruised? What if he's broken? What if, and I said, we just caught the climax, the emotional climax of our film, and you're worried about it. But she was right. And then what happened was, he went in, and Kerry Fox had just arrived on the set. And Kerry Fox had been watching this on the playback on the monitor. And she started crying. Her first, on the set, the first time she saw him crying watching this kid. He goes outside. She has already gotten bags of ice. She has bags of ice in his face. And she's kissing him and holding him and rubbing his head. And I'm sitting back watching her going, He's a mother and son. This is fucking beautiful. I told everyone to leave them the fuck alone. We'll catch you. We'll, we'll play catch up in a while. They're together. They're talking to each other. She's kissing them. The whole lot. Everything is fucking beautiful. So by the time it comes to them playing mother and son, they've already gone through an extraordinary emotional journey. Well, you can't capture that on a page. You can't capture that on a shot list. You can't capture that in a pre-production meeting. It can only happen through the payback for audacity. Make sense? Yes. And the lovely payoff to that story is those two fuckers are lovers now. And they've been lovers for, for two and a half years. Who? <laughs> Kerry and Mo. Really? Yeah. <laughs> He's banging his mother. <laughs> Terry, I, I just wanted um, um, to say to you that back in the 90s, I loved the play that you did in Intercore of um, the Greek theatre because you have wonderful use of space. And I was really sorry that you left. I'm no longer a teacher, obviously. Jesus yes, there you are, just to make <laughs> you feel young. Um, so what I really liked about that play that you did in the 90s was the way you used space. It was just extraordinary. One of the things that was really very interesting about the film there was the choreographed